All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Chris Waters here on the GameSpot stage. Super excited for an extra long preview demo of Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. And joining me on stage, dude, I have totally just forgotten your name. In the long time we've had to talk together and like hang out, I feel so bad. It's not Talion. It's Michael DePlatter from Monolith Studios and uh, Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. Really impressive showing yesterday during the press conferences. Nominated for a GameSpot Best of E3 2014 award. And, uh, you know, you're trotting the game out, getting people to see real solid demos of it now in action. How, how does it feel to have it out there? I think, uh, I mean, it's fantastic. Amazing. And, and what's really exciting, and I think, you know, a bit different, it's every single time we do a demo, mm -hmm. it's different. So, like, we literally can't, you know, can't show it the same way twice if we wanted to, so... That must make your demoing job a little bit nicer, you know? Yeah. Get some new stuff cropping up every time. Especially, like, you know, day one it's fine, but by day three, like, we... Yeah, it's really going to be very, very different from having to do the same thing a hundred times. It's very cool. All right, well, we've got a long demo to play through, so let's just get right into it. And, uh, Michael, why don't you set the stage for us? Uh, where is Talion at this point in the game, and what, what's his goal? So, um, the game takes place. It's set in between The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Okay. But kind of like both of them, it's kind of a standalone story in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, so, at the end of The Hobbit, Sauron gets defeated by the White Council. He gets driven out of his fortress of Dol Guldur, and he returns to Mordor. Yeah. But he's been away from there for 2,000 years. And over that time, Gondor's been occupying Mordor. Um, so basically, it's kind of the night Sauron comes home. And, and that's where our game's actually <laughs> going to be. Hey, guys, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. All crap. Yep. Dark Lord so is back on the scene. We, uh, it's going to crap up the whole place. And uh, so that's where, we, that's where we begin our game. Um, and at that moment, when he returns, Gondor's been guarding these things for two millennia, and, and obviously over that time, with not a, as much going on, the guard's fallen off, it's down to a skeleton crew, and you're Talion, you're one of those rangers, and when Sauron returns, you're slaughtered along with your family, along with the other rangers on mm -hmm. the gates. But Sauron's return also awakens this other ancient the spirit, um, who has a very, very deep tie to Middle-earth lore, to the rings of power, and a very ancient grudge against Sauron. And then that spirit is awakened and resurrects Talion, and then together the two of you go deep behind enemy lines and kind of take the fight to Sauron. Back into the realm you sort of once guarded and the fortifications you once inhabited now being turn to Sauron's use as he builds his army in Mordor. Yeah, and then, of course, 60 years later, we're going to see them as the Black Gates of Mordor. They're going to be garrisoned. Um, but, it, you know, that's a long way in the future, and Sauron's got a lot of work to do to build his forces up. So, you know, you can make a big difference to the fate of Middle-earth by how much you can get behind enemy lines and really mess with his, mess with his plans. Every last orc counts, man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so this is... In a way, it's uh, you got a little bit of a an origin story for Sauron, you know, yep. not, a, not his origin vis-a-vis -vis his Lord of the Rings incarnation, but you're sort of telling part of his story in addition to Talion's story. Yeah, that's something we're really excited about. You know, there's there's a number of different characters from uh, the books that we bring in, but I think the one we are really excited about developing is Sauron, mm -hmm. because a lot of really what you see in The Hobbit is the necromancer, so he's a very distant sort of character, and the same in Lord of the Rings. He's he's pretty abstract as the great eye on the Tower of Barad-dûr. We get a few little references to him. Gollum yeah. refers to the, the black hand of Sauron, but we really don't get to develop him as a character, and uh, Tolkien actually put a lot more into him as a character, into his background, into his history, and in particular, one of the intriguing things about him is the Rings of Power. He worked together very closely with the elves on that, so he wasn't always this just total incarnation of evil. He, there's enough uh, depth and nuance and, you know, to actually deceive the elves and work with them. So we get to explore a lot of his backstory and, and more of his motivations That whole as well. Ring of Power storyline is so much about the corruption of people and the, yep. corrupt, the creation of this evil as opposed to, you know, we just dug up this horrible evil from deep beneath the mountain. It's, no, we sort of wrought this evil ourselves in the hearts of man over the course of millennia almost. Uh, and so we got a little glimpse of sort of a setup there and now we're right into it. And uh, branding war chiefs seems to be the task at hand. So, yeah, what we've seen, um, basically the character we just met is Marwan. Um, and 
She's a queen who's deep behind enemy lines in Mordor. She's the leader of um, basically one of the sort of the holdouts of, of Gondor's kingdom that were in there. And she's drawn you deeper into Mordor. Two reasons, one to help the resistance there. And secondly, to learn more about the identity and the mysteries and the power of this, this wraith. And, and this is sort of the key to how our game works a bit because she's given us our story objective. We can do more than just hunt down and kill and assassinate our enemies. Uh -huh. We can bend them to our will. We can actually, you know, make an army behind enemy lines. But kind of what's um, important is that how we go about doing that is going to be completely different for every play. Like you're really free in how you approach and here that we goal. And here we see one of those inflection points where you see where the player experience is going to diverge because you got this whole rogues gallery of war chiefs and you're picking the ones to target? Yeah, exactly. So there's two things. One, um, I mean, we're obviously shortcutting things here to, to show you of here course. today. Yeah. In the real game, there's a big chance that a number of these guys that are the leaders and the war chiefs are going to be people you've met two, three, four times before. They might have started as a sort of a lowly, a lowly guard as an archer on a tower and they fought and battled and backstabbed their way up to here. So your arch villain, your boss, mm -hmm. can be completely unique to your game. Some of them you mightn't have met before, but uh, they'll be different as well. But every single time you get a playthrough, they'll be different. And so, you know, here, for example, this guy, the executioner, it's not just them waiting in the world for you. They're out there actually living in the living world. They're hunting you as you're hunting them. They're actually going on missions. They're battling against each other to work their way up. They're the gaining society. experience and yep. getting more powerful as you do. Yeah, so, and, and that's the thing. It's, it's partly about, um, you know, we're really trying to create villains here, which is, is partly about making them all play differently because they have different strengths and weaknesses, uh -huh. um, but partly about them, you know, sort of having different personalities and identities. We're really trying to make super villains, basically. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, having they have their own origin stories, all of which they have scars that you've left on them. And the thing that really pulls it together is they remember. So it, it's really a way of putting the player at the center of the living world. Because if you've done something awesome, whether it's ruined this guy's feast or saved him from certain death at an execution or turned up on his greatest fear, whether that's a monster or whatever, uh -huh. he's going to remember that and respond to it, and his personality adapts to that as well. He can become either terrified or enraged by the things you've done to him. So it's, uh, it really plays out in a meaningful way for, for the gameplay. And so it's interesting, you're talking a lot about you know, how these, these villains and their personalities change, but I was reading a preview we have up on GameSpot written by Randolph Ramsey when he got to play the game, yep. and what struck me is how he his sort of feeling towards the villains evolved because yep. you know you say you sort of you can encounter these guys a few times his encounter was he would he got cocky he went into a melee this lowly orc killed him he respawned but when you come back into the world time hasn't stopped yep you come back into the world that thinks you're dead and that you got killed and so that orc was promoted to captain yep. and so he came back and he's like you know what i'm gonna go after that guy and like he tried to go after that guy, and he blew it again. And so that orc got promoted even more. And so the nemesis building was on his side as well as, as in the game. Yeah, and that was fascinating to me. I mean, really, you know, there are a few inspirations for that. One is the sort of grudges you can get in against another player in multiplayer. Sure. So, you know, actually making AIs and NPCs that double down on that same feeling that you are, you know, building up um, relationships with them. And, and secondly, you know, that they're remembering you. They feel, we want to make, create the feeling that they feel like that as well. Yeah. And then also, so often, like I think one of the, um, you know, often one of the least fun things to do in a game is to die. Because if you die, usually what that means is, okay, you get to go back and do the same thing you just did and failed again, you know, failed at. Yeah. Um, which maybe wasn't fun, maybe it was, but you've got to try that in order to proceed. And very much in a way that's in line with how we see the ring rates in the films and how to, and that ability to resurrect we wanted to turn death into an opportunity um, so and that works in a few ways one by as you said by killing you yep. that obviously gives them a lot of status they've just taken down what is from their point of view the biggest villain of mordor uh -huh. so you know that moves them they're up in hero, society yeah. they're heroes <laughs> to their uh, to their mates so they move up um, but secondly, it creates that opportunity for vengeance and for you to hunt them and, and build your legend as well. Absolutely. Now, uh, 
I want to get into sort of some of the combat mechanics we're seeing play out here, but I'm taking your questions via Twitter, folks. Uh, so tweet them to me. My hash my handle is CT Waters. That's why with two T's. And use the hashtag GameSpot E3. Poison Monkey One wants to know: Can you set rival or you know sort of turned armies against each other in your sort of orchestrations and manipulations? Uh, yes. So we have. Well, basically, we didn't want to over complicate it. And so in the sense, you have there's really two factions. There's Sauron's army, uh -huh. and then there's the guys you bend to your will. I mean, to some extent, it's like Saruman. His way that he believes to take down Sauron is to fight force with force and sure. to build an army of Urukai in order to take on the Dark Lord. So, you know, it's, it's similar. So we don't have multiple sort of sub-factions within that. But once you um, actually dominate and bend one of these guys to your will, uh -huh. you can absolutely continue to Im increase them in power. So you can send them on miss missions to prove themselves. You can make them fight duels against other orcs. Once they battle all the way up to actually become a war chief, you can set rival war chiefs against each other. We'll have you know large scale battles like we see in in Kirith Ungol, um, where they'll actually bring their own bodyguards. So you, you, wow. you truly can build up and farm and build your army and then ultimately take those guys that you've built and farmed up and leveled up against your ultimate enemy, which are these black captains and they're sort of our, uh, our tentpole villains, the guys that are personally responsible for your death and the death of your family at the start of the game. So it kind of escalates, but we really want you know to carry that through that you build your army behind enemy lines and you really do take that against uh, the Dark Lord. Very cool, Michael. Uh that sort of, so the overarching story, as you alluded to there, is one of vengeance. This is a revenge-fueled tale. This is a, this is not a guy trying to, you know, I mean, you know, he's not, his primary goal isn't preserve the last light that remains or like fight against the oncoming tide. Like that's, that's part of it. Yep. But also personal revenge is a huge part of that. And that's not a narrative that you see terribly often in Tolkien lore. So, I mean, you know, how did, how is it to sort of weave that into this world, the, yep. the story you guys are writing, that revenge-fueled, you know, plot into the, the greater fiction? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really good question. One of the things that's amazing about Tolkien is he does cover this incredible spectrum of, of tones. And in some way, the deeper you go back into the lore, uh -huh. into the first age, into the second age, so some of those really epic heroes, people like Beren, people like Fionor, you know, these sort of guys actually do start off driven by revenge. And they really do start out as as, as, as bad guys, as bandits, almost as criminals. Really? Um, and I think some of that earlier lore is, is really closer to the kind of myths that inspired Tolkien as well. These myths like Beowulf and these Nordic myths that, that are sort of pretty dark. Um, so, you know, I think in that sense, we are sort of very, very true to and authentic to Tolkien. Plus, we're also very much in line with those heroes like Boromir. Boromir is not someone who was conflicted about the idea, that, or, or Saruman for that matter, who's conflicted about the idea that the way to take down darknesses, darkness is with ruthlessness. By that any that means required. necessary, yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, and Tolkien's obviously pretty clear that ultimately that's not necessarily the way to, to that you're going to win or be victorious but but Boromir is interesting because ultimately he is a heroic character because he was ready to sacrifice himself ready to actually doom himself for yep. what he perceived was the greater good so mm -hmm. um, you know that's that's a journey and an arc that we're we're really interested in exploring as well all right well I want to blaze through some of these questions from Twitter we are getting a ton of them thank you folks for sending them in keep them coming uh, so some of these you're probably not going to be able to answer, but I'm going to throw them at you anyway. I'll do my best. Uh, Andrew Barnett wondering, are any members of the Fellowship going to appear in the game? Um, not directly. So, you know, we, we, I mean, very much like The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, we want characters uh, who are, you know, important to the lore yeah. to appear when it's appropriate. But sure. we sort of didn't want the Forrest Gump just having them cameo in there for the for the sake of it. So there certainly are characters from Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit that appear. In the similar vein, Zahra wants to know, are we going to see some elves in the game? I mean, obviously it's a very orc sort of man-heavy setting. Yep. 
But those aren't the only two races in Middle Earth. Uh, we're going to see multiple races, including elves, in some really important roles. All right. Uh, we've got questions about the about the open world. James Cole wants to know, sort of, you know, are you just ride, running roughshod over the plains of Gorgoroth here? Like, is, how how far and wide can you sort of span in the open world? So. Um, Mordor is kind of many hundreds of miles along each side. Yeah. So uh, it's not continuous. You know, it's divided into into regions. So sure. the opening part of the game is around Gorgoroth, is around Udun, the Black Gates, uh, Kirith Ungol, the Fortress of Durthang. So that's sort of a large uh, open space there. Mm -hmm. And then what we're actually showing here, which is the Sea of Nern, is another completely separate zone. Um, that you've traveled to sort of many hundreds of miles. So it's a number of uh, distinct zones and areas. All right, we've got questions from people who clearly have some, some Tolkien lore background. Yep, curious good. about uh, any using the Silmarillion as source material, but pulling in any of that sort of world building stuff as well? So yeah, that's a, a great question as well. So we have um, the rights to The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and the appendices. Um, and the thing is within those, there's a huge amount of information and depth in regard to all of the history and characters of Middle Earth as well. So we, you know, we really can draw on all of that deep history. You guys have a lot to work with. Yes. <laughs> Does it get a little daunting sometimes to like delve deep and just see the breadth of this world that Tolkien created? Uh, you know, I think it's almost like doing um, a historical story, historical fiction. It's like you're creating a world and a story in a real place. Yeah. Um, and in the same way, if you're drawing on reality and history, it's big enough and expansive enough that you can tell your own story so you're not restricted in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I almost can't imagine a type of story that you couldn't tell within Middle Earth. It's, you know, it's as big as World War II. Like, it's the massive. scope of it is, is huge. So you guys got a significant research department over there, Monolith, huh? Yeah, we got some pretty <laughs> hardcore uh, fans. And, and Middle Earth Enterprises are great, so we have a lot of people fact-checking. And the other one that's great is um, our Wakia site. Uh, you know, the fans on there are so fantastic. Like, we can just, obviously, there's threads in there breaking down, discussing everything, um, which is cool. There you go, folks. You want to tip the scales uh, in Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor. Get yourself into some deep Tolkien lore forums. <laughs> All right, let's now let's delve into combat proper because we've been watching a lot of it. We haven't really talked about what we've been seeing, sort of specifically in terms of mechanics. Actually, here's a, a choice moment that I think yep. you're going to encounter more than once throughout the game oh, uh, to kill or to dominate. So this is actually I, I haven't been watching exactly what's been going on, but we've got to a point where there's a war chief. He's down on his knees. He's defeated. Uh, we've got two choices. We could kill him at this point. And that's the end of it. And then we can go into some of our um, upgrades, which are our runes and how you actually customize your weapons. Or we can dominate. We can bend him to our will so he actually becomes our minion. Um, it's your choice. And, uh, you know, it. obviously it's sort of one of these factors that kill. affects the way it's going gonna, it's gonna to branch out. Are we calling for the kill? Yeah, let's kill. Are you giving the thumbs, thumbs down? down? Thumbs down. Yeah. There he goes. <laughs> All right, Finish so you got to do a little work. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> oh. His head is he's flipping around. You guys. His last words. But there's uh, a nice rune we get. So, okay, so what happens then? He's eliminated. <laughs> Bang. Oh, great. I had me watching. So there was another, that executioner we met earlier. Uh -huh. He's bent to our will. He was a bodyguard of that guy. So that space that's created allows our follower, our brand of guy, to move up and take that position. Move into the position yep. of power. And so that's one of the ways you can kind of uh, take over the war chief, start to build your army. But now some other guys have turned up at this fight as well. And so give us a little, just a little uh, breakdown of the kind of UI elements, the on-screen uh, indicators that are giving us the important information you're going to need to succeed in combat. Yeah, so... Um, of course, above his head, this guy that uh, the life drinker. Yep. Uh, that's turned green. Basically, green in in our game. That's a language for intel, gathering intel, learning your enemy's strengths and weaknesses is really important. So, uh, there's enemies in the world who are who are worms who have information. You can grab them, interrogate them to learn the strengths and weakness of these bosses. But if you want to get that information from one of the captains, one of the bosses, you've got to break him down and weaken him first. So when that skull turns green, he's, he's ready, you know, he's ready to for be you to dominated. Um, the, the, the crown and the blue we can see on, on the other guy that was round to the left, 
uh, that shows he's ours. So yeah, that indi it indicates that the power of the Wraith has, has dominated this guy as well. Yeah, I saw um, that a second ago. You did a little Wraith mode, and it's sort of like the blue flash came over him, and it was that gaunt, skeletal, skeletal really freaky-looking Wraith face yep. that we saw in Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, how much are you guys relying on or drawing from Peter Jackson's movies to influence the visual style of your game? You know, I think... Um, so we worked with those guys right from the beginning and everything goes through them for the um, approvals and so we really had that as a starting point but one of the things everyone's been so encouraging on is you know don't don't make a movie game make the best possible game that you can make and to be fair you know that's what that's what the movies are they're not just the book on screen they're these amazing films so we really wanted to take the inspiration from them of doing the best we can with this material in our, our medium. Um, and so, yeah, I think it was a starting point, but I, th I think we've sort of evolved into to something that has its own own flavor as well. But the the power of the ring race, whether it's in the books or the films, is uh -huh. the power of fear and domination and bending your enemies to your will. So that idea, that concept of what power means, whether it's a ring of power or whether it's the wraith, was, was absolutely the influence for what sort of power we can give you as the player to build your army behind enemy lines as well. You guys didn't go the Tom Bombadil route, drawing your powers from nature and living in seclusion? <laughs> Tom Bombadil's awesome. He's one of my favorite characters. He's the one guy in the whole books that gets the ring and just tosses it in the air. He's the only yeah, thing in the whole books like, all right. that's outside of all of this, you know? Whatever. <laughs> even Gandalf Galadriel, they can't even take the ring for a second, so... He's pretty awesome. I, and the other quote I like about Tom Bombadil is, uh, which, which Tolkien said was, even in, even in a world of myth, you've got to have mysteries. You know, you've yes. got to do something new. You've got to surprise people. And that's really uh, important to us as well. You can't just, it would be so inauthentic to Tolkien to just rehash things people have seen before. Mm -hmm. It's really authentic to these stories that you, you, you do introduce something new that's still consistent and authentic to the to the canon. Give some, you know, players something, people something new to discover within that world. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so the Wraith, as we interpret it, it's not exactly maybe some things have been seen before, but it's completely authentic between within what's possible within the lore. And I think the more people learn about it, you know, the, the cooler that's going to be as well. All right, Michael, I'm going to dive into some more Twitter questions. This one I've been getting a lot from Starkiller, from Joel Evans, from uh, any number of folks on Twitter. Wondering about gameplay modes and specifically any kind of multiplayer. Uh, it's a, the campaign is single player. We're really focused on the single player experience. Uh -huh. um, but in terms of kind of social play and competitive play, we have a couple of things. We have um, some missions called vendettas. So because your enemies that you're creating are going to be so unique to you, if one of those guys kills you, can actually create a side mission in your friends game. Uh, where they can go and hunt that guy down who killed you. They can achieve vengeance for you, and if you do, you know you both get upgrades and rewards for doing that. Oh, that's kind of a that's kind of a cool way to make that sort of yeah play off that revenge plotline yep. is like, avenge me, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. sending that Xbox message. Yeah, it's just <laughs> nice, and you know the showdowns will reflect that and so on. Um, and then the other thing, our, our challenge mode, we've sort of got a, a challenge mode that's quite unique to our Nemesis system as well. So it's a bit different. Different uh, difficulty levels. We have a version of Sauron's army. We have some really tough war chiefs we planted in there, some captains. And uh, then you can basically, can you, can you clear that without dying? It's like a hardcore mode. How fast can you do it? How many points can you get? And then we have leaderboards for that challenge mode as well. Right on. So giving people a way to sort of take this combat system and take their own sort of unique character build that they've customized and uh, really put it to work in a competitive way, yep. you know, to, to sort of flaunt it yeah. over their friends, well, or at least try to take their friends' scores yeah. down. And of course, the ability to share videos, and now I think there's going to be so many moments of that from our game that, you know, people are going to want to show to each other and share these yeah. really unique kind of boss fights that they're only going to see in their game. Well, Michael, we're coming to the end of this demo time, oh, that and that means we have some good news and bad news. The bad news is, like, a ton of the questions people are asking about combat mechanics, about customization of your character loadout, about all those sort of stuff you guys were seeing pop up about, you know, gaining little buffs and gaining skills. We didn't really get into that this demo. Fortunately, Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor is going to be coming back to the GameSpot live stage cool. shows 
every single day of E3, we're going to have a demo tomorrow and on Thursday. So keep an eye on the GameSpot schedule. See when that's coming along. Come on back, and uh, we'll get to those questions, hopefully, because there's certainly a lot to talk about, as we found today. And uh, the game is just looking really great, Michael. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Really pleased you could come on. Looking forward to seeing you uh, in the coming days and learning more about Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor. Thank you. Cheers.